Gold participants and listeners from around the world. I'm Kristen Schwarz, licensed midwife and MC for Gold Learning. And I'm here today with Lourdes Santabaya Mora. And uh, we're getting to know her a little bit today and we're chatting about her upcoming presentation. And I'm so excited to have you here with me today. Welcome, Lourdes. Thank you. <laughs> It's so wonderful to have you here, and thank you for spending time with me today. So before we get started, tell our listeners a little bit of where in the world you are located. Where are you coming to uh, to, uh, to us from, from today? Okay, I live in Puerto Rico, which is a small island in the Caribbean. Uh, it is part of the Americas, um, where... Uh, uh, actually, we're it's a we're a country, but we are a colony of the United States, a territory, a U.S. territory, um, and our, the main language that we speak here is Spanish. Well, thank you for introducing us to Puerto Rico here to let us know where you are. Uh -huh. um, and we chatted a little bit earlier. You mentioned something about tree frogs are singing at night. Tell us a little about the, oh, about what's going on well, in the nature there. Um, let's see if that happens when I do my recording because it will be in the evening. But we have a tiny frog. It's called the coqui. And the reason uh -huh. it's called the coqui is because it makes a sound that's coqui. Cookie. And if you're not familiar with the sound when you are listening to a presentation or at night um, or whatever, I'm talking on the phone or uh, in any situation, the, the little frog just comes out in the recordings. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. we won. On the day of the recording, we will uh, listen to and see if we can hear the cookie singing yes. at night in the background yeah, when you're presenting for us. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, so, Lourdes, tell us a little bit about yourself, your professional journey, uh, what, and what you're up to right now. What are you working on? All right. Well, I am uh, an international board certified lactation consultant, and I'm also currently studying my master's degree in clinical nutrition. Um, I'm a single parent, a uh, div divorced mother. I have a 10-year-old almost 11-year-old uh, son and a 12-year-old daughter. Uh, I actually, I breastfed my daughter until eight and I weaned her brother at the same time when he was six, but I'm not breastfeeding anymore. <laughs> and um, I started as a La Leche League leader and uh, then I took the exam to become an IBCLC. I had a dream uh, very much since the beginning, I believe very strongly in mentorship and in community development and in leadership training uh, that I wanted to open a clinic that would be dedicated to provide direct services to breastfeeding families while it simultaneously created mentorship opportunities and training opportunities, particularly towards community health workers and uh, peer counselors. So really uh, coming from the community perspective, but a funny thing, and that's what the reason that I started studying clinical nutrition is because I wanted to have that allied health credential but a funny thing happened on the way to my dream and it was a hurricane called Maria which hit the island uh, in uh, uh, September of 2017. It was two weeks after another uh, hurricane Irma which did not impact us so greatly but following the hurricane I realized that I was in a unique position because of my connection as a community leader and uh, around breastfeeding and because of my contacts internationally, I had already been doing education around infant and young child feeding and emergencies. Ironically, thinking of it as, a, as an issue that was unrelated to me, that I was helping other people who were distant from me. And at that moment, it became very clear that something had to happen. So I started an organization called Alimentación Segura Infantil. I co-founded it. I have a, um, a co-leader uh, in, in creating that organization, but we've now grown. We have five directors. We have 10 community health workers who are called portavoces who are regionally located around the island. And we have started a volunteer network of um, up, up here counselors. They're called CASICAS, which is a, an acronym. And we're doing very well uh, in terms of of creating more knowledge and creating more leaders from the community base so that 
number one priority is maintaining lactation and breastfeeding. But number two, we remember that equity is the focus and community is really how we're going to be able to to make a difference. Uh, and if sh if it should happen in the future that we have another disaster, we are training first responders and um, just creating more awareness around the, the the things that could happen after a disaster if you're prepared and if you're not prepared and what are the specific needs of, for babies. Right, and, and it sounds like you're doing fantastic work there in the organization too. Um, I have to tell you, uh, and we chatted before about that, I, I'm here in South Florida and you know we, we experience hurricanes as well, but when we saw what's coming, when we watched Hurricane you know, uh, Maria, um, we we were so devastated. We sat here and and we were crying because we know it meant um, devastation and loss of life and 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 such. So so can you tell us a little bit how that what, how you know um, how it yes. felt, what it felt well, like, what it was um, like? It was it was very surreal because as I mentioned, there was a, we were in uh, at very early September, Hurricane Irma came. And Irma was supposed to devastate us. And I remember hearing the, the meteorologist saying, I need you all to take this seriously. If this hurricane impacts us the way that they are predicting, we are going to remember life before Irma and life after Irma. Mm. And we, I prepared for the hurricane to the best of my ability, and Irma didn't hit us very much, at least where I live. There, we were without electricity for four days, and the northeast, I don't want to say that it didn't impact the island because there were communities that were right. affected, but at least where I live, where I live more in the north central part of the island, we weren't affected. But what happened, less than a week later, like a week and a half later, we get like we get this information that there's this storm developing in the Caribbean and you go again and you try to stock up on food. And um, mm -hmm. for Irma, I had enough gasoline in my car, but for Maria, I didn't have time to put gas in my car. I went to the store to try to buy batteries, but the batteries were gone because we live on an island and right. the, sh the shelves had not been stocked up. So that when the storm came, I, you know, my property was secured as the best as it could be because I had had it that way for Irma, but I didn't have enough gasoline. We thought we had enough food because we prepared the way that we were told to prepare to have enough food and water for five days, but things did not open. Um, supplies did not arrive. And Puerto Rico is, because we're a colony or a territory of the United States, we think that we're a developed country. And how can I explain that when you go outside the day after a storm and you just see the devastation around you and when supplies don't don't arrive, you realize that you're a sub developed country and that you're completely dependent on your colonizer and um, there we weren't going to die. At least I wasn't going to die because I, I have the fortune of living in a cement house and having had people who I, I didn't have a lot of devastation, but there was a period of time when the supplies were not arriving that I would cry at night when my children went to sleep because it was so scary. And that's coming from somebody who was in a secure and great space. There are the particular parts of where the eye passed in the mountains, uh, the, the way that people live here, um, not everybody has a cement house. Um, not everybody has sturdy property. There was just so much loss of life and devastation. We weren't ready. We were not prepared. And, and it, uh, how, how is the situation now? Well, it's a year and a half later. Um, the, Puerto Rico is, has a unique situation because we were facing an economic crisis before the storm. Uh, we have a very large debt and because we don't have control over our own destiny because we're a territory of another country, the debt is being remanaged by a fiscal control board. I participate on the Children and Youth Task Force uh, Steering Committee of Puerto Rico and 86% of people under the age of 25 are making what is called the minimum wage, which is not considered to be a living wage. So that many young people, whether they're professional or whether they're non-skilled labor, 
are leaving the island to find a better opportunity for themselves. Um, so recovery from the hurricane also has to contemplate recovery from our economic situation mm -hmm. and create thinking of ways to create micro businesses and more opportunities for female heads of households or poor people or black people or queer people who may not have the same opportunities to get to the big city and be hired and for right. what maybe to be working retail in a store selling you know bread or yeah. hardware for somebody or movie tickets for somebody not necessarily um so slowly that you know things are being rebuilt uh and people are getting back together but we still have quite a lot of economic instability and uncertainty about the future and it's an island right. and one of the topics that i'm going to talk about when i do the the speech yeah. is just as i was unprepared you are unprepared and perhaps you don't think that climate change is happening and perhaps you aren't thinking about it but a disaster is something that can happen at any time yeah. um and it is really a good idea for everybody to be prepared, be prepared. for anything yeah that's uh, you bring up a very valid point, and and also something else I want to bring up because we were chatting just before you know our little uh, sit down here we were before we get to the, got the recording started we we were chatting about uh, you became also I mean I'm sure you were resourceful before but I'm sure you became extremely resourceful after the disaster and and more conscious. So you mentioned for example you didn't have an Ethernet cable that you needed for this presentation and uh, you know there was so much garbage. Can you? Can you talk what you did then? Can well, you tell us again what, what you did? What, happen, what happens is when a, when a disaster would happen 20 years ago, we would have these trucks that they right. call oases or like oases, and they would be the ones that would distribute water. But now what you get are um, truckloads of bottled water. Mm. And I will go to one of these large um, wholesale retail stores um, when there is a, a storm alert and people are just buying bottles and bottles of water. And the thing that we don't realize about plastic is that even if you recycle plastic, that's not better for the environment. The only right. thing that it's doing is, um, is keeping plastic out of the landfills, but there is um, gasoline or there's fuel that's used to, for the process. There are fumes that are released. In fact, there's a program that is run out of the University of Puerto Rico that studies toxins in the bodies of pregnant people and mothers and babies up until five years uh, to try to make correlations between preeclampsia and premature birth and uh, genetic illness. And one of their findings is that after the hurricane, the amount of plastic in the human body, so in our organism, went up. Wow. So having that information, uh, I have tried to be more conscious I already was a little bit of a of an environmental have some environmental conscious but you know we were given a very high quality water filter I do not buy water bottled water unless it's an extreme situation I, I really genuinely think that bottled water is going to kill us um, and so when I I had had an ethernet cable in my home and you know after the storm or you do, do your periodic cleaning of the house i saw this ethernet cable in a closet i'm like i'm never going to use this again and i threw it away well what happens is i was contracted by gold lactation to do this speech and one of the requirements was to have an ethernet cable and i am not i was not going to buy an ethernet cable because i knew just the same as i had thrown one out somebody had to have an ethernet cable in their closet um that they weren't using and so what I did is I did a shout out on social media does anybody have an ethernet cable it took me like three shout outs but I ultimately got the, the I got the cable so um, I try to not buy bottled water I'm not if, if there are things that I know that people are gonna have I'm not gonna I'm not right. gonna buy it Right, mm -hmm. because uh, and yes you mentioned there's so much there was so much trash after the storm that you know it makes you really think twice about what you you know um, 
about being it, it really makes you more conscious as well as you mentioned it makes yeah. you con and mm -hmm. and um what, right at, at the time where we were doing a lot of the recovery work and we, we like one of the things that happened here is that we were all totally or partially cut off from telecommunications because a lot of the the cellular phone satellites flew with the storm right. so i didn't ha i did not have signal at all for two weeks but if i left my home i could go to the plaza and like put my phone up in the air and get text messages um <laughs> Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, I mean, that's, that's how it was happening. So that's how I was communicating. Um, but we would get in our, you know, we would get in our cars and we would, you know, just go to different places. But I, I would make the joke that, um, that we were living the apocalypse. I don't know how much of a joke it was. Mm -hmm. um, I would always say, I'm like, we don't know when the apocalypse is going to happen, if it's going to happen after our grandchildren die, mm -hmm. or if it's going to happen in three years, or if we're living it right now. But we are living times of devastating climate right. situations and, um, and just in, in general, civil unrest and, and certain things. Yes. So that... Um, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, but that, yeah. that's the, that's how I felt. There was just the fear and um, knowing in a way it's a cycle because if we mistreat the environment, the environment is trying to clean up our atmosphere and our the organism, which is the earth, and hurricanes are part of that cleaning process. And I, I think if oh, well, another thing that would happen here a lot, many people were using gasoline generators for their homes mm -hmm. because wow. um, I was I was very fortunate. I was without electricity for two and a half months. Mm. Uh -huh. So yeah. and there were people there were people who were eight months without electricity or even um, nine months. And so many people were using generators and I did not want to use a gasoline generator generator because I just felt like, wow, I'm going to be contributing to the to the problem. So it's that um, return to basics. Um, but how do you survive when you're used to your daily luxuries? Um, right. And el electricity is an essential it's you know we we can't say oh electricity is optional your your telephone to some extent has also become necessary a computer not so much but you know we work using our computers and um well the and the the technology we were not able to you to do card transactions at stores um, mm -hmm. So even we have a, um, a method of food assistance, which is given by the government, but it's through a card. People who are poor depend on that to eat, but they would not accept the card. If you had not taken uh, cash out, um, how were you going to go to a store to buy anything? Because all they were accepting was cash, but you couldn't even um, take money out of the bank. So, That's right. yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, now talking about your um, presentation here on equity and safer feeding, infant feeding in times of disaster and civil unrest, and you mentioned that before, we really leave, live in in, um, in difficult times. Uh, I looked up the numbers here on World Refugee Day 2018. The United Nations Refugee Agency reported that a record of 68.5 million were forcibly displaced at that year. A record high number of women, men, and children were driven from their homes across the world due to war, violence, persecution. Um, and that does not even include um, natural disasters or, you know, climate change uh, refugees, basically, also. So let's talk about your, your presentation. I think it is so important. It's such a, you know, that topic really with all the numbers. Uh, we definitely have to to hear this. So, so talk to us a little bit. Um, what you will be speaking about? Well, I'm going to be. I mean, I, I I mentioned very briefly what we're talking about right now, which is the you know the the, the what is the, the climate change and what are the different types of disasters? Because there's human made disasters, just as yes. there are natural made disasters, and there are infrastructure failures. Um, so there are many things that could that could lead to. I'm sorry, that can lead to, uh, that, are, that, that is classified as a disaster. But what happens with infants, we know that human infants are, um, are very immature and depend uh, completely on the adult. And um, people either think that babies are okay because with their mother, they're with their mother or their father or their parents or their family. Um, or the second thing that they think, if the babies are not okay, let us send infant formula. And I don't think that people are scheming to send powdered death to an island. I think that people when they people very genuinely want to help. But the problem is that if you 
have to make a line to get gasoline and it's 10 hours long and you don't want to take the baby with you because it's hot and um you thought the you thought that the gasoline line was going to be three hours you didn't think that it was going to be a 10 hour line um and your baby is at home with a family member and formula was dropped from a helicopter into your community what's going to happen to your baby and what's going to happen to your lactation um and that's just, just to give you an example um the shelters that we visited or the communities that we lived that we visited Visited. People who didn't have water, running water in the communities, people who were washing clothes in the river and getting water from the river and, and using that to drink, uh, and some of the diseases that came up around that. In the shelters, the families were not given access to heat to disinfect the baby bottles. Mm. And then I had to go to the plaza, take my phone, send text messages to my people and say, what can we do? Um, you know, with all of the, don't send, don't send power powdered infant formula was the was one of the the call of one of the messages that was being sent and finally i said to my support network that was in in north america and canada and the united states that i said you know um uh, it, ready to feed liquid infant formula is a safer alternative for families who are combination feeding or who are primary who are only formula feeding uh, but caviar is also very yummy non-perishable food um, what can we really do to try to, you know, to, to work with our reality? Because powdered infant formula is lighter, it's cheaper, that's what's going what, what's gonna to come. Mm -hmm. um, so just, uh, I mean, a, a lot of, like, what, what is it that we actually want to do with the families? What would be first responder sorts of actions for families with infants and young children that will uh, preserve the breastfeeding relationship where it exists, which will lead to relactation when that's a possibility. Um, and if relactation is not a possibility, then to be humanized because uh, more with more and more uh, in, uh, increasing numbers, there uh, it may be changing the, the world numbers. If we look at them, I'm going to talk about the world breastfeeding numbers, but it's declining in some nations. Uh, mm -hmm. In other nations, the, it's it's increasing. But at this to this date, worldwide, more infants are formula fed than breastfed. And I assure you that their mothers and their families love them. And they never said, ah, after a hurricane, I don't care. That's not what they were thinking. You know? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, Lourdes, thank you so much for sitting down with me here. That was absolutely interesting. And I am looking forward to your presentation, Equity and Safer Infant Feeding in Times of Disaster and Civil Unrest. And thank you so much for sitting down here with me today. Thank you, Kristen. I'm looking forward to talking to everybody on the date when I will give my talk. That's right. And the date of your presentation, the live date, will be April 25th. But um, check where that is in your time zone. And this is for our listeners because in Australia, that might be a different day for you. So if you want to find more, uh, uh, find out more information on this presentation and the other presentation in the Gold Lactation Online um, conference. This presentation is part of this online conference. Go to goldlactation.com for more information. And we hope to see everybody there at the Gold Lactation Online Conference in 2019. Thank you, everybody, for listening here today. Bye-bye.